Getting new lenses for your camera is always great, especially when you get them on a great deal. But sometimes Lightroom doesn't have correction profiles for those lenses. So there's a few ways to combat this in Lightroom uh, or Photoshop, I guess, if you use that as well. You can use the manual distortion fixing tab in the develop module in Lightroom. You can also try and find a similar model lens from a different brand in the already made profiles and hope that it'll fix the problems with the distortion of your lens. Or you could just ignore it completely. So sometimes you might not be able to get the desired look from your lens that you want. So thankfully Adobe has a software that's completely free that you can use to help fix these distortions. For some reason there wasn't much resources that I could find on this software. So this video is all about everything that I learned in the process and uh, hopefully that you can learn from this as well because I didn't seem to find many resources outside of the PDFs they give you along with the software. So right off the top, one thing to note is that I'm using a 12 millimeter rectilinear wide angle prime lens. So the first thing you're gonna need to do is download this software. I'm gonna leave a link down under this video because uh, it seems to be kind of hard to find sometimes. So the first link in the description is the one with the software in it. Once you get to this page, this is where you're going to find the download and then you're also gonna see some PDFs linked as well. You can go ahead and click download for whichever operating system you have. Let that download run and then open it up. Uh, feel free to extract it right away. It doesn't really matter where you extract it to. So within this folder, we can see that there is the application itself. For Windows, you can see that there's an EXE, so that's the software itself. It's called Adobe Lens Profile Creator. Then we have three other folders. We have the calibration charts, documentation, and sample images. So within the calibration charts folder, you'll see a bunch of different PDFs with the calibration charts, all named after the details within the image. Basically what these charts are is the way that the software reads the distortion in your lens. Clearly there is a lot, but realistically it only really matters for the size of the print that you're gonna be making. You can go all the way down to an eight and a half by 11 normal size of paper, or maybe even smaller, all the way up to a nice big print like I did. So you can go for pretty much free with an eight and a half by 11, all the way to a fairly more expensive, maybe $20 cardstock like I did or even frame it and pay even more. So choosing the individual PDF that you're gonna be using is up to you based on how much you're willing to pay for this. When we open one up, we can see that there is some specs down at the bottom. Uh, we have the version, which is the rows and the columns, which means that there's 29 squares high by 41 squares wide. And then each individual square is 36 points wide and tall. These are details that the software will be looking for to make the adjustments a little bit more detailed. Next up, if we go back one folder, uh, we can go and check out documentation. This will give you, we have the calibration chart shooting guide. We have the chart shooting quick start guide, and then we have the application user guide. So before you get started, you're probably going to want to check out the calibration chart shooting guide first and see what that says about your lens and which chart to print out. For this procedure, a bigger print is gonna help out a little bit better because you get a little bit more detail with the print. Right here it says, if shooting for the first time, Adobe recommends choosing one of the following PDFs to print and then choose the largest size you're able to print. Then just a little bit underneath that, we can see that it gives some print specific details like matte, white, heavy duty, or cardstock paper. So for this print, I went to Staples with the PDF on a USB stick, gave it to them and asked them to print it on cardstock. I specifically requested matte because glossy can give you some uh, issues with the reflections from the lights that you're gonna be setting up. And overall, this cost me just under $30. So it's not too expensive. And once you have it, you can mount it on a wall and just set up your lights every time you need to make a new profile. It doesn't really look all that bad for a little art piece in your office anyways. So I think I'm just gonna leave it hanging now and enjoy the chessboard on my wall from now on. So that brings us to the actual setting it up. This actually took me three or four different tries. Originally, I just wanted to do it at home because I didn't wanna to have to bring it all the way into my office and I didn't wanna to have to come into my office every time I wanted to calibrate another lens. But 
You can see here, I tried to mount it right up to beside a window because I only have one light at home. I was hoping I could put one light at one end and then use the window light from the other, but I couldn't get them to match. And lighting for this procedure is fairly important because uh, with proper lighting, the software is going to be able to detect the vignetting from a bad lens, which will help the profile correct all the vignetting in Lightroom. So you're going to want to get the lighting set up correctly. Uh, the software is fairly forgiving, but the better you make it in real life, the better opportunity the software has to make a good profile. So to do this, you're going to want to get two lights and set them up at 45 degree angles, shooting directly at the checkerboard, chessboard, uh, image. If you don't have that, you can try using ambient light from a window or a door. Or since summer is coming up, you could probably take it outdoors and put it on the ground. Try to keep it clean, I guess. Or tape it up to a wall outside as long as there's no shadows and the lighting stays consistent. Once I got all the lighting set up, the next thing was to take the photos. Having a ball head on your tripod is going to help a little bit better, but a pan and tilt head on a tripod works just the same. So the user guide mentions the minimum focus distance. Uh, I honestly don't understand how this works because it doesn't say what to do with the minimum focus distance. To frame up your shot, you wanna have the piece of paper within your frame, but still have a bit of space around it. This is because we're gonna be taking a set of images and moving the camera around uh, so that space is going to come in handy. You're going to want to set up your camera where the camera is level with the center of the image, center it up and make sure that it is uh, properly focused. You'll see later on that my camera wasn't perfectly focused even though I used a tape measure and I thought I was doing everything as perfectly as I could. Once we have the lighting and the camera all set up, then it's just time to set our camera up for the shooting. Basically for this, you wanna go full manual, put in a color temperature so that it doesn't fluctuate over the images. It doesn't really matter if you're perfect or not for this. Set your camera to manual mode, set it to manual focus. You're also gonna to wanna to set it to F11. This might require you to pump your lighting up a little bit more or drop your shutter speed way down so that you can absorb a little bit more light. You're also gonna to wanna to make sure you don't have any of those creative profiles on your camera. So a standard or a neutral profile will be great for this. Once your image is perfectly focused in your camera, it's time to start taking the photos. So you're gonna to wanna to take one photo just facing the image. Next up, you're gonna to want to loosen your ball head or your tilt head. Bring it down so that the top row of checker marks on the image are just under the top of your frame. Make sure you're not cutting these off in your frame. Then we're going to move over to the top right corner. It doesn't really matter what order you do this in, but uh, it was just easy for me to follow along this way. You're going to want to make sure your camera stays fairly level, but put the top right square into the top right of your frame. Again, make sure you're not cutting off any of these squares. Take that photo, move down and shoot where your horizon is level with the center of the image, but you have the right edge of the squares line up with the right edge of your frame. Take your photo and we're gonna do this for all four corners and all four edges. So top, top right, far right, bottom right, bottom, bottom left, left, top left and top and then that'll give us a set of nine images, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine including the center image that we shot at the start. Next up, we're gonna open up these images into Adobe Bridge. You don't really have to copy them over to your hard drive just yet. Uh, select all of your images, right click on them, and then open them up into Camera Raw. From inside of this, we're not doing any processing. We just select them all, go to save images and then save as a DNG. You can go through here and change up the way that you're saving the images. Just make sure you have JPEG preview set to full size instead of medium. Uh, and then all the other settings should be fine. Go ahead and save that and then click done on camera raw. That'll close up and now you'll see some more images populating here. These are the new DNGs that we just saved. This is the image file format that the software is gonna be using. And then we're going to go to the software itself now. So that might be in your download folder or wherever you saved it. Now that we have the software open, we're going to go and click new project. 
Then we're gonna go file and then add images to project. Find the DNGs that you just saved and select them all and click open. Now that we have all of our images in the software, we're gonna go and look to the top right. This is where we're going to name the profile. Uh, the profile name can just be your camera and then the lens name. Your camera name obviously is your camera name and then the lens name. So the profile name can just be your camera name and lens name copied and pasted into one together. Right underneath that, we're gonna to go to calibration. I used a rectilinear lens here and I'm wanting it to fix distortion, chromatic aberration and vignetting all together. So I'm gonna leave those check marks left checked on. Then down at the bottom, we have the numbers that we're gonna input. The software may detect it all automatically, but uh, just to double check, down at the bottom on the print, we can see that it's 13 by 21. So we're gonna put 13 by 21 on the rows and columns. Then we also have the print version, which is 108 points in, in my case here. And then there's screen dimension in pixels. So what we're gonna do is zoom in to the image nice and close to one of the squares. And then at the bottom right of the viewport, we're going to click on the little ruler tool and we're going to go from the left to the right of one square. I like to do this on the very bottom uh, just to make sure that my horizon is correct and I'm not adding extra pixels for the height. So just bottom left to bottom right here and it's going to see that it is 109 pixels across. We can see that that was added to the screen dimension. I think it should be pretty close to the print dimension if not exactly the same. Uh, again, the software is forgiving so you should be able to get away with a few pixels difference here. Here we can see that my lens and my camera really need to be cleaned but regardless we can go ahead and start the process right now. To do that, we're going to go up to the top right and click Generate Profiles, and that's just going to start reading through all of our images now. I seem to have an issue where uh, it goes through all of my images and then it stops with an error. I didn't realize what that meant, so I just keep closing it and then trying it again. But if at least three of your images get processed, you can see that when it gets an issue, it's going to flag the last image that had the issue, so all the images before that were fine. So if you have three images that were fine, you can actually make the profile with just those and you can just scrap the rest for that profile. Once it's done, it's gonna give you a pop-up. You can rename the file name and it should open up to the folder where your profiles are currently saved. If not, you can just go through and file, find that on your own. Click save and that should be it. Now that I have that saved, I'm gonna go ahead and find some of these images that I took that might give off a little bit of distortion. Taking these shots actually made me realize how good the lens that I was using already is for distortion. So looking at this image with the trees, I was expecting a little bit more warping because it's only 12 millimeters, uh, but it looks pretty good here. But let's go ahead and go to the profile tab. Gonna enable lens profile corrections. Then I'm gonna go down to the lens profile and find the name of the lens profile that I was making. And voila, this is what it looks like with and without that new profile. And we can go ahead and check this other image of the fence that is poorly focused. Again, I was expecting a little bit more distortion right out of the camera, but I'm not displeased with this because I do not mind. But we can see that the profile does fix some of the distortion and some of the vignetting that happens on the edges of the frame. So that is it. That's how to make your own custom lens correction profiles for Lightroom and Photoshop. That is it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, drop a like. And if you loved it, drop a subscribe. Catch you guys in the next one. Peace.